Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to our conference cycle, Humanities, uh, Territories and Society. I am Vito, your uh, MC for tonight. It is a great pleasure for us to welcome you to this conference uh, given by Remy de Mulier, Paremi, from National Institute for Oriental Language and Civilization, also known as INALCO in Paris. First of all, I would like to thank our partner, uh, the French School of for Asian Studies, also known as ZBO, the co-organizer of the event, the French National Research Institute for Sustainable Development, also known as ERD, for their technical assistance. Also, I would like to thank all of you for coming, especially the students of STIK. Welcome to IFI. Um, brief introduction about Paremi. He is currently preparing his PhD thesis in geography at Inalco. For his thesis, he is focusing in the social environment for minibus entrepreneurs and driver in Jakarta. Minibus includes Angkot, Bemo, Metro Mini, and Kopaja. Also, I would like to remind you that Paremi speaks Bahasa very well. So you could test his Bahasa Indonesia during the question and answer session. <laughs> but I won't take the stage too long. And so without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Pak Remy. Uh, good evening. Selamat malam. Bonsoir. Uh, para ibu bapa, para hadirin yang terhormat. Uh, paling dulu saya, uh, ma saya mohon maaf sebelumnya karena saya akan menggunakan bahasa Inggris supaya semua hadirin bisa mengerti. Tapi kalau nanti ada pertanyaan yang ingin ingin disampaikan dalam bahasa Indonesia, silakan. So uh, I switch to English. Um, I'm a PhD student uh, in social and urban geography uh, at Inalco in Paris. And I began this research on um, minibuses in Jakarta in 2014. Uh, so now this is my fifth year of, uh, of PhD, and it's beginning to be a long time. <laughs> um, first, I would like to thank uh, IFI Jakarta for giving me the opportunity uh, to present the findings of my research. Uh, and as I said, this is still an ongoing research, so um, all questions and remarks will be welcome. Uh, and I guess a lot of you know much about Jakarta minibuses and transportation system, maybe as, uh, as daily users. So the first thing that puzzled me about minibuses uh, is their longevity. The first services of minibuses date back from the 19th, 1930s. And minibuses still exist now, even though their extinction have often been predicted, as we, uh, as we see here. Uh, Metro Mini Tungu Mati. Uh, this is a contemporary example of such predictions. Uh, now, every month, you can find an article uh, in, in the mass media telling you that Metro Mini are going to disappear in the following year. Yet, if we look back to the past, we realize that these predictions are nothing new, actually. Uh, like in this article from 1978, uh, published in Compass, that article uh, questions whether Oplet, Oplet is the ancestor of contemporary Ancot, whether Oplet will disappear by themselves or not. Actually, they didn't. Uh, they were replaced by the Microlet in 19, 1980. Microlet uh, are a category of ANCOT, but this was a decision from the government, so they didn't disappear uh, by themselves. And these microlets are still plying the streets of Jakarta today. So, to make it simple, my point is, according to mass media and the majority of politicians, minibuses have been bound to disappear for almost 50, uh, 50 years. It has been 50 years, we hear every year, that minibuses are going to disappear because they are obsolete. But most of them never did, so they are still there. Uh, before, uh, before going ahead, I, I want to make it clear what I'm using the term minibus uh, instead of uh, Metro Mini, Copadia, Microlet, Ancot, Bemo, etc. Um, Metro Mini, Copadia, Ancot may seem more familiar to you, but actually I'm using the term uh, minibus as a generic category that refers to all buses that are smaller than conventional buses. Moreover, all types of minibuses share some features. 
First, they are operated by indiv individual entrepreneurs, not by uh, big structured companies. Their drivers are freelance, there they are no uh, contracts for the drivers, and they operate on fixed routes, and that's very important, uh, as we will see later. In Jakarta, this category includes medium buses, about, uh, they have about 25 seats, and uh, the number of standing passengers tends to infinite uh, in rush hours. <laughs> We also have in this category small buses, or ANCOT, uh, which have about 14 seats. BEMO. Um, BEMO are smaller uh, three-wheelers. And OMPREGAN, as you can see here. OMPREGAN are minivan opera minivans operating without licenses, um, under various forms. The oldest OMPREGAN are just pickups, and the more recent ones are real cars that operate from the major business centers to the periphery of the Jabodetabek of Jakarta. So how to explain this resilience of minibus uh, business in Jakarta, even in the hardest economic and political context? Uh, my point is, I argue that this resilience is due to the fact that the minibus milieu is deeply rooted deeply embedded in Jakarta's society and urban space. To show that, we will first investigate the history of minibuses in Jakarta, the way they adapted to the changes of uh, urban space and urban society. Um, then we'll get to know the transporters themselves, that is, the minibus entrepreneurs and drivers. And eventually, we'll address one of the major political issues the minibus sector raises in Jakarta today, the question of its regulation and also self-regulation. So, first, uh, we'll see that minibus really mirrors um, urban space and history in Jakarta. Jakarta actually is better known for, uh, for, the wide, for the widespread use of cars and for its gigantic traffic jams than for its public transportation system. But the origin of minibus, uh, of minibus services precisely lies in the lack of government investment in the public transport system for almost 50 years. The origin of automobile, uh, automobile dependency can be traced back to the colonial period uh, so even before the independence, because from the beginning of the 19th century, Batavia began to expand to the south, from the old colonial center to the Veltevreden area, which is today the Monas and Kondandia area, and then uh, southeastward to Jatinagara. Um, after the independence, um, Oh, before independence even, at that time, urbanization was followed by the construction of a tram network uh, connecting Kota with Veltevreden and then to Tanaabang and Jatinagara. So there was mass uh, transportation at that time. And after the independence, the tram lasted for more, uh, one more decade but with uh, a decreasing service quality, largely due to the lack of spare, paths, par spare parts. Why? Because these spare parts were Dutch-made and imported from, uh, from Holland, so it was more and more difficult to get them uh, after the independence. In 1960, the first Indonesian president, Sukarno, decided to discontinue tram services. Uh, the rails were not even removed. Uh, they were just drowned under asphalt. Um, why, uh, why did he do that? There were at least two reasons for such a decision. There was a technical re uh, reason. Uh, trams were getting more and more expensive to operate and to maintain. And there was also, also a symbolic and political reason. Tram was not seen as a, a modern means of transportation compared to subway and above all compared to cars that, uh, in the 50s, embodied ur urban modernity. 
So the trams were replaced by buses operated by a national company, the PPD, Rusan, Pangangkutan, Jakarta. Um, and the PPD was uh, actually born from the national nationalization of the former tram company. Under the new order, transport policies even more obviously focused on cars and private transport planning. Uh, toll roads were con constructed to connect, uh, to connect Jakarta with its surroundings, and the uh, existing avenues were broadened. The construction of uh, toll road at that time fueled uh, urban sprawl. This process was closely associated with the construction of new residential estates in the periphery for the middle and upper classes, uh, like the, the first one being Pondok Indah, and then uh, new towns like Bumi Sarpong Damai or uh, Lipo Karawachi, for, for example, among the first to be built. Um, and the, the biggest real estate developers had close relationships uh, with the government. So in that context, uh, the huge needs for public transport were not addressed. Uh, and the, PP, the PPD fleet uh, was upgraded, of course, and augmented, but uh, it remained far from sufficient. So, in that context of lack of public transportation, there was an opportunity for small entrepreneurs. The first minibuses in Jakarta's history were Oplet, small minibuses built from old cars. Uh, you can see here, it's a 1971 photo taken uh, in uh, Taman Fatahila. Um, and here, you, you also have the ancestors of the, of the Metro Mini and Copaja of today. Um, Oplets actually appeared before independence because the first Oplets services appeared in the 1930s along trams routes and directly competed uh, with the tram. But the real boom of Oplet services happened in the 1960s after the tram was phased out. After that, other Oplet routes quickly developed and the network expanded. In 1980, Oplets were replaced by Microlet, an Ancot, uh, one of the Ancot type that still exists today. Uh, they are Microlet of the blue uh, Ancot that you can see uh, in Jakarta Street. Uh, Oplets and then Microlet routes connect the major terminals situated in the fringes of central Jakarta to the core of Kampung or residential areas, apart from the major avenues. Um, in the early 60s, there were also two new types of minibuses that appeared. The medium buses, that you can see here, um, and the BEMO. Uh, both were launched initially as auxiliary transport for two major sport events that were hosted in Jakarta uh, in, the, in the early 60s. Uh, the Asian Games of 62 and then the, new, the games of the new emerging forces of 63, the GANEFO. Medium buses were initially bought by the national government uh, from so Carlos Coman order. But after, uh, after these uh, sport events, they were sold to small entrepreneurs because they, they were too expensive to, uh, operate, to be operated by the government. And BEMO they were directly channeled to small entrepreneurs through a credit uh, system. Medium buses owners then gather, gathered into two major organizations, uh, Copaja, that was founded in uh, 71, and Metro Mini, founded in 76. The medium bus network expanded then, and its geography is slightly different from the microlet route, uh, as you can see on this map. Uh, because it mainly serves, uh, it's, it's a green, uh, green route, uh, it mainly serves uh, the, main, the major avenues with, with a higher density if so, uh, in several administrative and commercial core areas like Menteng, Kobayoran Baru or Senen. In the 70s, the city sprawl uh, continued uh, at, a f at, a, at a very fast pace. So the new urbanized areas in the periphery represented a strategic market for transport entrepreneurs. Uh, new entrepreneurs then seized that opportunity for, uh, by operating Omprengan pickups from major terminals to the fringes of Jakarta. 
Um, and in 1986, they founded together a cooperative in order to get official licenses. That was the Kaweka, Cooperasi Wahana Kalpika. And the Omprengan were converted to the red Kaweka Ankot that you still can see now uh, in Jakarta's peripheries. Um, here in red, you can see the uh, Kaweka uh, root network. And as you can see, it's really specialized in servicing peripheral areas of the of the DKI Jakarta. So, in the second half of the 20th century, minibuses were uh, able to fill the gap between the offer and the demand of public transport. They also adapted, uh, ad uh, they also adapted to the rapid urban growth. Since the end of the, 90, uh, of the 90s, though, minibus businesses have to face a new context. Um, first, there was a boom in motorbikes use, as you probably know. <laughs> motorbike was a harsh competitor for the minibuses because contrary to cars, it became a popular transport mode. It's accessible to the, uh, to the lower middle class, especially thanks to the development of credit. And now it contributes to uh, about 41% uh, of uh, daily mobility in Jakarta, whereas uh, buses, including uh, the Transjakarta busway only accounts for 17% in 2010. The second shock experienced by the minibus was the construction of new mass transport networks from the, new, uh, from the early 2000s. Why, why did uh, uh, transport policies change at that time? Uh, it was in the context of early reformacy, uh, so na national and local governments were more prone to promote public transportation as before. There was also a change in international context. Uh, international organizations promoted um, sustainable mobi mobilities and the development of mass, uh, mass transport networks. So in 2004, the Transjakarta bus, ra uh, bus Rapid Transit, the Transjakarta BRT, was launched. Uh, under the administration of uh, Governor Sutioso. Um, the Transjakarta now is better known as Busway. It has a dedicated lane, as you probably know, uh, and the mini minibuses, surprisingly, have no access to this lane. So both are public transportation, but they don't have the same status. Now the Busway runs on uh, 13 routes. Um, and it first impacted, uh, it impacted on mini, uh, minibus services, but it first impacted on medium bus routes. Why? Because um, we saw that me, uh, medium bus routes, Metro Mini and Copaja routes mainly, mostly operate on major avenues, major, uh, major thoroughfares, and they are uh, so they are concentrated on major avenues. And uh, the, the busway also operates on the same avenues. So there was a direct competition. But in the last four years, um, Transjakarta also began to impact on Ancot routes uh, as feeder services were opened. Uh, you can see that, um, for, for example, there was a case around the feeder service from Pluit to Kapuk in 2014. And because, uh, because also of uh, extensions of busway corridors to surrounding municipalities, is the, the blue uh, routes that you can see. Uh, so now even Ancot uh, services are harshly competed by uh, the busway. Um, yet it, it does not mean that the whole sector is in crisis, uh, as the mass media would like to say. Uh, it, it, it's not a, a crisis of the whole sector because it depends on the scale we are talking about and who we are talking about, the drivers or the owners, the entrepreneurs. Actually, the minibus sector has a complex structure and is deeply rooted in the city. So now we are going to uh, analyze, to, to present the minibus milieu. This professional milieu has two main protagonists, entrepreneurs and drivers. So first, the, entrep uh, the entrepreneurs, um, are very diverse actually. Um, 
The minibus milieu as a whole is very difficult to study uh, as a statistic entity because we, we have absolutely no available data on minibus entrepreneurs and workers. The only thing we have is uh, the number of vehicles officially registered. Uh, there are about 47,000 uh, vehicles in the whole greater Jakarta. But it only takes into account those who have uh, an official license. So the Omprengan and Bemo are not uh, included in, uh, in this figure. Um, for a Kaweka route that I investigated myself, there were 97 vehicles owned by 12 entrepreneurs. Uh, and most of these entrepreneurs owned between 8 and 10 uh, vehicles, as you can see. But these figures, uh, actually, they, they had a wide diversity of entrepreneurs' profile. So we need to have a look on more qualitative profiles that I picked up from my interviews. I give, uh, give on purpose, two very different uh, profiles of entrepreneurs. First, I would like to present you Julius. Of course, it's not, it's not his real name. Uh, Julius can be described as a minibus magnate. Uh, from the 80s, he operated uh, he operated and cut on eight different routes in Jakarta, in Depok, and in Bogor. He also operated taxis. And in 2011, he sold his Ancot fleet to buy 26 Copaja medium buses. So he has a large amount of capital, of course, to buy, to buy all these vehicles. But not only, he also has strong social connections due to the strategic positions he occupies. He has a high, a high position in the local branch of Organda, uh, Organda, the Syndicate of Indonesian Transport Entrepreneurs. He also works as a sales executive for a distributor of Toyota cars and motorbikes in Indonesia. And these two positions allowed him to facilitate the adoption of uh, the Toyota Kijang as the leading model for most ANCOT entrepreneurs until 2000. So, the two, these two positions are strongly connected and use them. Now let's um, let's meet Rati. It's not a real name, too. Rati Rati is closer to the figure of uh, to, to the profile of a small entrepreneur, but with a twist, as you can see. She only owns two Ancot with her husband, and it's mainly her who runs the business, because her, her husband has a, another occupation, another activity. He controls gambling in one of Jakarta's major terminal. Terminal where, where Ratis and Cot operate. And the majority of gamblers, who are they? They are Ancot drivers. So Rati and his husband and his husband really, really well complement each other's. Uh, one comment one common element to almost all these uh, entrepreneurs, uh, apart from them for the diversity, is that they all, um, they all operate minibus as a side business. It's not their main occupation, it's not their main activity. So let's have a look now at the galaxy of drivers. Uh, for mini, um, minibus operation is largely a side business, as I said, so most entrepreneurs have to hire drivers. And most minibus drivers are all informal and freelance workers. And there are absolutely no figures about them, no statistics about them. But here I want to use uh, data from a survey made in 2012 by um, an Indonesian transport expert, Darmanin Tias, the founder of the uh, NGO Masyarakat Transportasi Indonesia, and uh, his team. They interviewed about uh, 900 drivers, and among other things, they asked uh, them about their professional background, their last job before becoming anchor drivers. Actually, we see that only a few of them have always been anchor drivers. It's only about 4%. Most used to work as uh, factory workers or employee, and there are also a lot of retailers and a significant part of jobless, jobless people. But we can notice that a significant part also uh, come from a previous job in the transport sector. Uh, for example, driver for other types of uh, vehicles. For example, it's the case of in, uh, intercity bus drivers 
who decided to switch to Uncots as they were getting older. So the distance was less, uh, less important. Thus, we can see that the minibus sector has a capacity to absorb its people who cannot find a stable position within formal economic sectors, and this point tends to be confirmed by my interviews. The relations between drivers and entrepreneurs is based on the daily rental system, in Indonesian, storan. The driver rents the vehicle from the owner, he collects payments from the passengers, Sometimes he hires an assistant to help him, in the case of medium buses, Metro Mini and Kopadja. Uh, why does he hire an assistant, a kernet in Indonesian? Because passengers are too numerous for the driver to watch them all and to ensure they all pay the trip. Uh, so they need an assistant. Then, then at the end of the day, uh, the driver pays, pays, uh, pays sorry, a fixed rental fee to the owner and keeps the rest of the gains. Uh, but he also has to pay for the fuel himself, gas or diesel, depending on the vehicle. Uh, as you can see in this table, there is um, a strong um, inequality between drivers and owners, be, uh, because the owners earns, in this case, uh, it's, uh, the table shows the case of a metro mini driver uh, that I interviewed uh, last year. Uh, the owner earns two, uh, 350,000 rupees per day, uh, it's the Sotoran, and he's sure he will always get, get the, the, that Sotoran, uh, that daily rental, because if, uh, if the driver cannot pay, uh, it will be indebted to, uh, to the owner. The driver uh, only earns 60,000 rupees per day, and even less if he has to share with his assistant, his Kernet. That's why more and more medium buses drivers now choose not to hire a carnet, an assistant, because it's, uh, it's, it's too hard to, uh, to share the, um, the earnings, because they are, they are, uh, the passenger, the number of passengers has decreased. But the galaxy of drivers is even far larger. Um, in a single day, a minibus can be driven by two, three, four, or five different drivers. Uh, because the official driver, the one that is hired by the owner, can hire substitute drivers if he cannot or doesn't want to drive. These substitutes are called supir tembak in Indonesian. Um, the official driver hires the tembak drivers to fill in for them uh, at less profitable moments of the day, for example, uh, at night when the number of passengers decreases. This system is interesting because it shows that inside the minibus milieu, Hierarchies are quite flexible and power relations are replayed at each scale, from the owners to the drivers, but also among drivers. Because of this complexity, the milieu is hard to control, especially from the government's point of view. Yet, the local governments have introduced several regulations regarding fares, routes and stops. Here I will focus only on two aspects, routes and stops, because they show how official and informal regulation processes intertwine. So first, the mystery of bus routes. Uh, since the 70s, all Angkot and medium buses uh, that operate with the license have fixed routes, and fi fixed routes are associated, associated to their license, as you can see in this picture. Um, when you, uh, it's a Kartu Pengawasan, so um, um, a, it's a, a document that proves the, the license and describes the, the route street by street. Um, but the mystery is where do these routes come from? Who created them? The government or the entrepreneurs? The answer is the entrepreneurs. So, these routes don't originate in a planning process. But not all the owners, not all the entrepreneurs can open a new route because it's very difficult. You need a lot of money and you need well-placed acquaintances. You need a social network. You must have direct relations within administrations at several levels, from the transport department, the military, district and sub-district heads, because they all, they all are part of the team that investigates the opening of, a new, of new routes. 
you also need to spend a lot of money for the root testing process. An entrepreneur told me he spent more than 200 million rupiah, about $30,000, to open just one route. So only a small elite of entrepreneurs can create new route. That's why routes have become the most important asset in the minibus milieu, even more important than the minibuses themselves. This analysis was first, uh, is not from me actually, it was first developed by one of my Indonesian colleagues and friend, Faris Pangegar. Um, if you're interested in the topic, I uh, strongly recommend you to read his book, Borobutruan, uh, Dynamica Politique Trajek Angkot di Jakarta, Struggling for Urban Space, The Political Dynamics of Angkot Routes in Jakarta. It really opened my eyes on the political and territorial dimension of minibus routes in Jakarta. So, entrepreneurs who own routes uh, will rent these routes to other simple entrepreneurs, those who don't own anything except uh, the, the vehicles. This rental is processed through organizations of, of various types, whether formal or informal. In Jakarta, it is made through formal organizations, namely cooperatives or companies. Ancot cooperatives were founded by powerful entrepreneurs to organize the rental of their routes. Some of these cooperatives have clearly developed sorts of territories in the city, and these territories are related to the background of their founders. One example is, um, among others, of course, is the Microlet cooperative Purimas Jaya that I investigated. It was founded by Navy officers for um, the present or future's re uh, future retired marines in the late 80s. So it was um, for pensioners. The routes controlled by Purimas are all located in the same area in South Jakarta, near Chilandak, Jagakarsa, and Chipedak. This area was not chosen by chance. Uh, it can be seen as a territory of the Indonesian Navy. The Navy has a base in Chilandak, the Bumi Marinir Chilandak. It's not a residential complex. Uh, the, the map is, is wrong. It's a, it's, it's a base, the Bumi Marinir Chilandak, and a housing uh, complex not far from there in Pondok Labu. So today, although the spectrum of members was enlarged to civilian entrepreneurs, this original territory of Purimas is still visible in the geography of Purimas routes. So even though routes are an official structure, you have permits, you have licenses, it turns out to be controlled sometimes informally by various uh, social groups. Stopping also is harder than it seems. Another issue that mixes informal and formal processes is stopping. Actually, it shouldn't be an issue, especially for many buses, because they don't have a fixed stop. They can stop whether they want. But actually, it's an issue. Why is it so difficult to stop? Because to be given the right to stop, they have to negotiate it with various urban authorities, whether formal or informal. First, road space is harshly disputed with the local government. Many buses tend to stop for a long time at strategic points, like busway stops or train stations. As you can see here, it's a photo uh, taken in Jalan Salemba, so, uh, at the busway station Salam Salemba UI. So you, you see mini buses waiting for passengers from the busway. Um, this, um, this long wait uh, in Indonesia and in the milieu is called Ngetem. Local governments and transport services uh, try to prevent them uh, from doing so using the pretext that it generates traffic jam. So many bus drivers are in a very weak position without official support from the government. That's why they are subject to another authority, informal and local authority, the so-called protectors. These protectors offer pro protections to the drivers that want to stop in a certain place in exchange of money. And if they don't pay, they just can't stop there. These protectors uh, are often uh, local strongmen, uh, Called, uh, the, the preman, we say in Indonesian. A third type of, of authority, also informal, is the chalo. 
cello are touts or coaxers in English. The cello are placed at important points of minibus routes uh, and they fill the minibuses by guiding the passengers uh, to the next departing vehicle. On these photos you, you can see um, a cello for the Ancot here and cellos for the Metro Mini here uh, and as you can see it can be either men or women uh, because of the Metro Mini cello are women. Um, Drivers so have to pay them for that service, usually about 2,000 rupees per, uh, for each bus field. Chalo are not really hired by drivers. Uh, they are not hired by owners or co purchase neither. But the drivers have no choice, actually. They, because Chalo place themselves in the strategic points of each route, and they de, fac de facto control the public transport traffic at the local, stain, uh, at the local scale. As a conclusion, uh, I won't answer the question, will Metro Mini or Ancot disappear next year? Because I don't know. Uh, I would rather interpret a widespread uh, slogan, uh, popular transport, transport, uh, transport We've seen how the minibuses have become the embodiment of popular transport before being partly marginalized by motorbikes and the busway. But they still play this role for those who cannot afford a motorbike, and there are citizens that cannot afford a motorbike, and those who cannot drive it, drive it, the elderly, the children, families with children, and the poorest fringe of Jakarta society. Minibuses are so popular because they say that they serve the whole city, even the most remote neighborhoods, which won't which won't be the case, for example, of the future MRT, which has been built in an already well-serviced uh, corridor. I think we can also understand the expression transportasi rakyat by reversing it. Rakyat transportasi, the people of transport or the transporters. There are still thousands of them in this city today, drivers, owners, and they have, as, you, as we have seen, their own rules, they have their own interests, but the reality, the reality of their presence uh, can not be ignored. Thank you. Thank you. Presentation. So uh, for this uh, first question and answer, I would like to invite you for first three questions, maybe, in Bahasa, in English. Terima kasih. Saya Istighfar ini saya salah satu kandidat untuk apply PhD juga dalam waktu dekat. Ini menarik sekali untuk saya, terutama saya ada dua pertanyaan setelah mendengar presentasi yang disampaikan. Yang pertama adalah sebenarnya Apa sih yang mendasari sehingga tema ini dianggap menarik untuk dijadikan disertasi untuk program doktoral? Itu yang pertama. Yang kedua, pesan signifikan apa yang ingin disampaikan kepada local government dan juga national government Indonesia dari tema yang diangkat ini? Dikaitkan dengan kondisi saat ini dan eh, prediksi lima tahun ke depan. Signifikan apa yang akan disampaikan, lalu keterkaitannya bagaimana, ada indi, ada impactnya sampai seberapa jauh, seperti itu. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Apakah saya jawab langsung atau? First three question, tiga tanya dulu. Oh iya, iya. So uh, I would like to briefly uh, conclude the question is why PhD thesis in uh, angkot minibuses and the future five years, right? Yeah. Next question. Okay, uh, bonsoir, Monsieur Rami. Bonsoir. Uh, je m'appelle Freddy, en santé. Uh, my question is, so from your presentation, you're saying that uh, the minibuses are still relevant today because there are a lot of stakeholders involved. Well, we say that from history, it's because of the lack of government intervention, uh, funding, and the willingness to invest in public transport led to this minibus economy, which is actually uh, really high in inequalities. Drivers are not receiving what they should. And the 
and the route or the routes, the stopping system is based on the market, is in is market driven. And now that we're seeing that uh, the government is willing to change, they're investing in uh, transport, they're changing, they're adding new uh, shuttle buses. And I don't know about Jakarta, but in a lot of the other cities, there's a high reluctance from the drivers because they feel that their jobs are being taken by a better transport system, which is actually preventing the government to be better because of the mess that happened uh, earlier. So what do you think uh, is the government's move that, that they should do to fix the mess that, that uh, uh, the mess, I mean, the mess of letting the market take over public transport. So the, the question is, should government fix the mess? Yeah, what? Or, um, or privilege the drivers? Uh, what, what should they do to fix? What should they do? To okay. fix the mess, and also still uh, benefit the current drivers. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, last question. Thanks. Uh, yes. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, I have a question. In your presentation, you don't talk about uh, Gojek or Grab and how they will impact the system both from the driver's side or the passengers. Uh -huh. So, is it a threat for the minibus system? Or? Okay. Thanks. Oke, okay, so pertanyaan pertama dulu, apa yang mendasari uh, topik ini uh, untuk jadi bahan penelitian dan bahan um, bahan disertasi? Um, yang menarik menurut saya, tapi itu mungkin karena saya orang asing ya. Uh, yang menarik itu bagaimana kita bisa, bagaimana suatu sistem transportasi bisa dibangun, dikembangkan dari bawah. Dari, um, dari inisiatif masyarakat dan bagaimana kalau begitu kalau sistem transportasi tersebut dikembangkan dari bawah bagaimana dia diatur secara formal dan secara informal juga dan uh, ya yang, yang menjadi yang menarik bagi saya itu 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 sistem transportasi yang tidak sama sekali di um, berdasarkan dari uh, berasal maaf dari uh, sebuah uh, proses penataan ruang uh, siapa penatanya sebenarnya uh, urban planners di situ mereka uh, itu um, pengusaha yang menjadi planners uh, in this case jadi yang yang menarik bagi saya itu meneliti itu uh, bagaimana sistem transportasi bisa dibentuk dari bawah dan bagaimana dikelola dan apa isu-isu um, sosial dan politik terutama yang um, yang ada di situ pesan signifikan apa yang ingin saya sampai, uh, sampaikan ke pemerintah sebenarnya tujuan saya bukan untuk um, untuk memberi uh, untuk memberi uh, apa untuk um, tujuan saya bukan untuk menjelaskan kepada pemerintah apa yang harus dilakukan uh, karena soalnya su su sudah banyak sebenarnya studi-studi um, uh, penelitian yang uh, mengandung isi-isi yang normatif yang memberi uh, yang memberi anjuran kata itu yang saya cari tadi yang memberi anjuran um, <laughs> sudah banyak sebenarnya dari tahun 73 sudah ada sekitar uh, antara 25 dan 30 studi uh, se uh, sebagian dari JICA yang um, yang uh, menyimpulkan bahwa har harus ada sistem transportasi massal berbentuk rel di bawah tanah dan dari tahun tu uh, 73 baru jadi tahun depan um, jadi mungkin sa saya lebih fokus kepada saya ingin mengerti kenapa studi-studi uh, tersebut tidak pernah bisa diimplementasikan. Bagaimana sistemnya berfungsi secara nyata. Uh, karena kadang-kadang saya merasa pengertian itu yang, uh, yang kurang. Uh, jadi kalau saya ingin menyampaikan sesuatu ke pemerintah itu mungkin pengertian itu. Uh, tapi saya tidak akan, saya tidak bisa memberi uh, anjuran kepada pemerintah. I would like to conclude uh, um, the answer.
master of Paremi. Um, what is interesting is that <coughs> the system is based uh, on the not top down but top and down to top. And what is interesting also is that the system transportation is not based on the urban planner, and the urban planner is the transporter itself. And it's for the government, um, he he also questioned why. <coughs> Uh, in fact, since uh, 73, there is almost 25 to 30 studies suggesting that it, um, there should be um, mass transportation with a rail-based transportation, under, um, underground train, but uh, we will have it like next year, since 73. And uh, saya juga saya hanya mau menambahkan ada dalam studi-studi itu mereka tidak hanya bilang harus ada sistem kereta tapi di bawah tanah mereka bilang perjalanan bis-bis harus ditertibkan. Di bagaimana ditertibkannya? Uh, itu masalahnya dan untuk menertibkan sistem transportasi umum harus mengerti bagaimana dia uh, berfungsi secara politik dan dari hubungan-hubungan sosial dan profesional antara para pemain um, ranah transportasi itu. Um, now the the second question. Um, yeah. Oh, you want to translate yeah, first? Yeah. Um, to add some um, comments on the paper also is that not just the rail-based system, but also to um, better govern the bus system, but the question is how, because it's already so complicated, so complex, and it's the question how to govern the bus system that's interesting. Uh, so, uh, for this second question, uh, of course in Jakarta there is a high reluctance of drivers. Uh, I, didn't have, I didn't have the time to talk about it, but uh, from 2015, there are, there are experiments to integrate uh, to integrate um, a small proportion of minibuses into the Transjakarta network. Um, it began with uh, some Kopaja buses in 2015, the Kopaja AC that then became the um, Kopaja Trintegrasi uh, busway. Um, then. Last year there was experiments with uh, Kaweka and they led to um, large scale experiments this year, but I wasn't there to see it. The OK Trip system that was launched by uh, the current governor, Anis Baswedan. Uh, and the, um, recently it was, um, it was enlarged again with the Jack Linko system. But the, the major um, obstacle, the, the major obstacle of that um, this integration process is that they um, there is a high reluctance of drivers. And why there is a reluctance of drivers? Because usually drivers are not taken into account in the negotiations. They negotiate with uh, cooperatives and owners, and owners um, they they are given a sort of uh, salary which replaces the storan, but the, the, the salary of the driver remains, uh, it's decided only by the, the owner. So I have an example for a Kaweka route that was integrated to uh, the Transjakarta system. The, um, the earnings, the daily earnings of the drivers dropped from about uh, 100,000 rupees to 30,000 rupees because of the experience. So of course they, they are. There is a high reluctance. So what should they do? How to fix the mess? Of course we have to fix the mess. Uh, I don't say the contrary. But um, we have to take into account those, as uh, someone said, someone told me in a cooperative, those young Suda Lama Burjasa Libidang Transportasi. We have to take them yeah, we have to take them into account because they have histories and they, are, they have a legitimacy and they have territories. Um, so, the main obstacle of that program is how to take into account the complexity of the milieu and how to discuss with drivers. Actually, it's very difficult because apart from the cooperatives, there is no link and there is no direct connections between the government, the planners and the drivers. So, 
I think the, the, the better thing that would happen uh, would be uh, that communication and that negotiation. But I don't see uh, now how it would be possible, actually. That's, that's the main problem, I think. Maybe the last question about the and, Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, th there was a th uh, the, th uh, the third question um, about Gojek and Grab. Of course, they have a, a huge impact on the drivers. Uh, and I also uh, didn't have the time to talk about that, but uh, they are very, very important. Um, they had an impact because of their fares that are very low. And sometimes they are almost as low as uncut fares. Uh, not now, but last year when uh, Uber was still um, trying to push the prices down to be uh, competitive. Uh, so they had an impact on drivers. Uh, they told me so. But the, the, the strongest impact of uh, Gojek and Grab is on uh, former Ojek. They... Uh, they almost disappeared now, and some of them uh, joined Gojek, um, Gojek and Grab. Um, but they, they do have uh, an impact on the on the transport system and on the minibus milieu, uh, of course, too. So, uh, maybe the second session of the um, question and answer? Or three more questions? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Lemmy. Uh, it is uh, my first time uh, I, I met all my expectation company like year, uh, evening like years because in the past the what is the, the speaker deliver is in, in based on uh, their knowledge about their like psychology sociology or something but here you make a like a clear observation about uh, transportation in Jakarta it's, it's give me like a clear descriptions from uh, Dutch colonial until now yeah but um, I wanted to ask the question but all, all the question already taken taken by another uh, what is called audience so I want to ask you why in Jakarta you make it research in Jakarta why not in uh, another city like in my hometown for example in Jogja because there is a uh, this interesting thing in Jogja that ordinary driver in mini minibus or in another transport they join and they convert to like integrated transport public transport in Jogja. So they they don't they don't replace uh, the old one. They they reinforce the public transport. There is interesting stuff uh, subject that maybe in the future you can. Can make it reset. Okay, another question is Yeah, uh, I think enough. Lah. Okay, now. Okay. Why Jakarta? Okay. Hi, um, thank you. My name is Anto. Um, thank you for the presentation. It's really uh, interesting and very insightful, especially because i really interested in inclusive growth in Indonesia. Um, only one question. Um, in the context of political economy, do you think which one is more important? Um, do you think that the government is unable to control or manage the minibus transportation in Jakarta due to the fact that all the owners are actually are elites, as you said in the Purimas case, they are all Navy officers? Or the second one, there, does the government actually benefit from the fact that um, minibus transportation actually um, serve the untapped markets? Right, um, and also um, on top of that, all the pol uh, all the government's officials are actually politicians who needs to maintain their voters' base and also serve <coughs> their uh, voters' interests as well. So, which one, which factors actually competing with each other and makes the government unable to control the minibus transportation in Jakarta? <coughs> Thank you. And uh, last question. <coughs> Uh, hi, Remy. Uh, thank you for the presentations in the first place. Um, my name is James. Um, I think one, one question. Um, I think in the last few years, we I, I get to know more about Jakarta. Um, there are a lot of people that is incoming into Jakarta, uh, as well as uh, permanent 
the people that resident grew up here in Jakarta. So during your during your research <coughs> and interactions with the drivers, or even with the with all the players in the public transport on these levels of Kaweka as well as the mini buses, um, are all the majorities uh, are they actually local? Are they actually grew up here? Uh, they, do, they, do they have actually KTP of Indonesia, of Jakarta, or they are actually coming from outside of Jakarta that they because they don't have any options here, then they fall into the slavery in the in the in the public transport. Um, and I think that's um, I think it's maybe you can actually give us more insight towards that on into the social structures of people who are in the public transport. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, why did, uh, did I choose Jakarta? Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a very good question that was not, uh, but <laughs> that was not taken until now. And it's a very difficult to, to answer to. Um, I will an answer on various scales. First, the, Indone uh, the international scales, because you can find non-centralized transport like minibuses in many other places in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, and even in uh, America. In Brooklyn, you have, uh, you have uh, small entrep minibus entrepreneurs in the Af uh, African-American community. So I could have chosen all uh, that cases. So why Jakarta? I, I, I wanted a place um, where the minibuses were um, in a situation of pressure and competition. And that's particularly the case in Jakarta, as you saw uh, in the beginning of this presentation. Because every day you hear that they're going to disappear. And it's related to their very bad image in the society too. Uh, I don't need to elaborate on the image of drivers, uh, but you, you probably know. Um, I, I, so I chose Jakarta because of this huge clash between modernity and um, the, not traditional, because it's not that traditional, it appeared in the 60s, but between modernity and the past system, uh, transportation system. The, the competition is very harsh. Um, and harsher actually than in other, uh, in other cities like Delhi or Manila because um, in Jakarta, before the arrival of the busway, uh, minibuses were not only Ankutan Lingungan, were not only local transportation, but were transportation, um, at, they, 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 uh, they were operated at all scales on all kinds of, um, of streets, of um, for our fares. Um, so the clash was um, stronger than in other cities. Um, so that's why I chose Jakarta. And from a personal point of view, I also wanted to the research on Indonesia, as a, because I, I had uh, because of my own interest for Indonesia, but there is a scientific uh, reason for that. So on a on a local scale, you know, on a national scale, why Jakarta and not Jogja, for example? I, I wanted a big city and a capital city um, because there are more things, more phenomena to observe, uh, more differences between the central areas and peripheries. So you can see more things uh, because everything is uh, in a larger scale. Um, and moreover, I could have worked on Jogja, but I wanted, I wanted a real BRT. And Trans Jogja, as well as Trans Pakuan in Bogor, is not really a bus rapid transit because it does not always have, uh, have um, an exclusive uh, lane. So the, um, the situation is not exactly the same. Uh, so I hope I, I've answered the, the question, and it's not, it's, it's not easy to, to answer. So then, now, now which factors make the government, um, why is it so difficult for the government to control the sector? Not exactly the same. Uh, so I hope I... Um, 
the government itself for the government to control the minibus sector because um, in an implicit way they favored their development until the 2000s from the 60s to the 2000s there is what i call uh, an implicit uh, transport policy that focused uh, that, that promoted the development of minibus why because uh, it was it needed no investment so it was it, it didn't need any uh, public investment and it was really adapted to the spaces and culture of um, of automobile actually because they use the same infrastructure um, they can connect the um, major avenues with the small uh, smaller uh, streets in the complex or in the campo not not the not the smallest street but uh, some um, they can bridge the gap between the central uh, the economic centers and the, the peripheries um, so the government favored the the uncut until the 2000s and now they want to uh, they wanted to dis to disappear or now they, they now they want to integrate it. Um, so wh why is it so difficult to to control them? It's because the whole milieu, the whole group of minibus entrepreneurs, is deeply rooted in society and space because of this long history um, of transport policies and urban development. The um, Question about the um, are they are the drivers um, long um, have they lived in Jakarta for a long time or are they uh, recent migrants? Uh, most of them have lived in Jakarta for a long time, uh, actually. Uh, but th there were migrants uh, until the it was a case until the 90s. Uh, there were the majority of uh, drivers were still uh, migrants, but now it's kind of second generation they don't uh, most of them were born in the Jabodetabek area or if they were not born in the Jabodetabek area they set, uh, they settled in Jakarta um, far before um, becoming drivers so they already have a Jakartanese background uh, but it was definitely the case uh, in the 60s, 70s, 80s uh, for um, Oplet drivers and uh, also for Betchak drivers, uh, Betchak especially, they, they were uh, migrants. For the um, for the Oplets, it was um, there was a variation. Uh, they, they, they were migrants, um, but they had to to know um, they had to know the city, <laughs> so they, they they had to they had to live in uh, Jakarta or in its surroundings for at least uh, two or three years. To be able to to work as a as a BMO drivers, but now most of the minibus drivers are um, living have lived in Jakarta for a long time. Um, maybe two last question. One, two. Okay. Selamat malam. Terima kasih atas kesempatan yang diberikan. Nama saya Riza Satifa. Uh, saya dari STIK PTIK. Sekolah Tinggi Ilmu Kepolisian uh, mewakili dari rekan-rekan ingin memberikan saran. Jadi Indonesia ini unik. Sebenarnya tadi dilaksanakan penelitian di Jakarta. Kalau Mr. Rini mau melaksanakan penelitian dengan komper, jadi dulu saya pernah berdinas di Kepulauan Riau di Batang. Di sana pernah terjadi satu demo besar-besaran yang menolak salah satu moda transportasi taksi berlambang burung berwarna biru. Nah, jadi hanya dibatasi sekitar kurang lebih 75 uh, armada, kemudian di sana ditolak oleh taksi konvensional. Dalam perkembangannya itu pada sekitar tahun 2015, uh, dalam perkembangannya sekarang saya kurang tahu. Karena saya sudah pindah, kemudian berdinas ke Papua Barat. Jadi di Manokwari itu, moda transportasi yang dominan adalah ojek. 
ada sekitar kurang lebih 10.000 ojek konvensional pada saat itu tahun 2017 saya dinas di Manokwari sehingga memang sama hampir sama dengan di Jakarta sudah kalah itu untuk uh, apa angkot tadi kalah sehingga ya kita buat forum komunikasi di sana jadi dengan kondisi geografis dan demografis yang memang sangat berbeda seperti tadi yang disampaikan oleh Mbak yang dari Jogja karena saya juga domisili di Jogja memang sangat unik sekali jadi mungkin bisa di compare dengan penelitian yang sudah ada dari daerah timur, barat dan tengah Indonesia untuk masukan ke depan supaya bisa lebih lengkap itu saja, sekian terima kasih. Terima kasih banyak, Bu. Um, ada pertanyaan ya, lagi mungkin? Ya. Hello, good evening. My name is Hilmi. I'm from University Negeri. State University of Jakarta. I want to ask about your opinion about what are the factors that make the minibus still running until now, even to ha has been predicted to disappear more than 10 years ago, and even to there are many cases regarding to the regulation about transportation regulation and safe regulation. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, jadi, ya, ter terima kasih banyak uh, atas saran uh, ini, Bu Lisa. Dan, ya, Indonesia memang benar-benar unik dan beragam. Jadi, ada Jakarta sama sekali bukan uh, bisa dianggap kota yang, uh, yang standar di, di, di Indonesia, dan tentu harus ada, harus ada perbandingan. Um, soal taksi, um, soal apa? Peng, uh, penertiban taksi uh, taksi konvensional atau taksi gelap sebenarnya di di, di, di beberapa tempat dan uh, persaingannya dengan uh, taksi burung berwarna biru tersebut um, ada kalau setahu saya terjadi banyak masalah uh, yang serupa di, di Indonesia uh, terutama di uh, bandara uh, di beberapa bandara di, di Indonesia kecuali di bandara Soekarno Hatta karena di situ sudah lebih uh, tertib uh, di beberapa bandara atau stasiun kereta api ada uh, masalah persaingan antara taksi gelap dan uh, taksi uh, konvensional dan Tentu saja itu berkaitan dengan topik penelitian saya, wilayah-wilayah uh, uh, pemain sektor transportasi dan kenapa mereka menganggap ini wilayah saya dan tidak bisa uh, dimasukkan orang lain. Um, dan kas, uh, apa, um, kasus Manokwari itu juga sangat uh, menarik. Karena di, di Papua situasi memang, uh, kondisi Papua juga memang berbeda. Dan uh, angkot yang uh, merajali, uh, ojek, ma maaf, yang merajalila. Um, dan angkot kalah. Itu sangat menarik. Itu menunjukkan bahwa um, permainan itu tidak pernah bisa, di, kita tidak bisa memprediksi atau meramalkan bagaimana um, Bagaimana akan uh, diselesaikan, uh, bahkan dalam jangkauan waktu, uh, da, bahkan dalam waktu yang sangat uh, singkat. Um, angkot kalah, uh, di, di Jakarta juga kadang-kadang angkot kalah. Uh, ada beberapa daerah uh, pada awal tahun 2010-an ini, kalau sekarang karena ada Gojek sudah, sudah beda, tapi ada beberapa tempat yang tidak bisa di dimasukkan di angkot karena ojek memang uh, menguasai wilayah itu dan mereka mereka punya lebih banyak backing di uh, di, di tempat uh, di, di di tingkat lokal karena mereka kalau ojek biasanya mereka orang um, mereka memang berasal dari daerah tempat mereka beroperasi kalau sopir angkot berbeda mereka 
mereka belum tentu ada kenalan di uh, di tempat-tempat yang dilewati trayek angkot tersebut. Jadi persaingannya sangat uh, ketat dan kadang-kadang angkot juga kalah. Um, uh, so the second question, uh, you want to translate first? Basically, the first question is uh, rather a suggestion than a question. Um, it's a, qu a suggestion to compare the situation in Indonesia, in Jakarta, with other cities such as Manokadi, um, Riau, and stuff. And Paremi says that it's all, it's <clears throat> it's interesting to compare with other uh, city, and we could not say that Jakarta is a standard city in Indonesia because each city has its own problem. Maybe it's the simple resume. <laughs> um, so the second question: uh, Why do uh, Angkot? Uh, why, why why are minibus still running? I would say that the factors are, are the same um, as the previous question, but why the government cannot control them? Uh, they. They are still running because actually they are very small businesses, and in, and they are side businesses. So in the, in this in this type of, of businesses, uh, the uh, profitability of the business it, it's not always a major question because even though your um, your earnings decrease, you still have your uncut. Mobuatapa. What do you want to do with that uncut? You 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 can. Now you can't even sell sell it. If you want to sell a, a, metro, a metro mini, for example, because metro mini is the most impacted uh, transportation mode, uh, a metro mini. Now you want to sell it. You you can you can have maybe 20, 20, 20 million rupees. That's all. So there is absolutely no reason to sell it, and you just have to continue because it's. Actually, it's more uh, like an investment. So, although you don't, uh, although it, it, uh, although there are ups and downs, you keep on uh, running it. And uh, yes, yeah, that's all. I think. Yeah. So, um, thank you very much, ba Remy, for your um, presentation. Thank you very much for your participation and your question. I would like to inform you that the presentation will be uploaded to our website soon and the video will be uploaded to YouTube as well and we hope to see you uh, in our next conference in November. Emerald Xiong is a French researcher in social science and cultural. She will talk about the marginal, marginalized voice in the oil palm, oil palm solution sustainability debate. Sorry. Uh, for now I wish you all a good evening and please enjoy some snacks in the lobby and free time to continue uh, the discussion with Paremi outside. Until then, bonsoir. Thank you. Merci. Gracias.